Well, hello everyone. This is Data Driven Formula One with Patrick Hansen, Gana Pogrebna. Hi, Patrick. Hello, Gana. Hello, all. And welcome to today's episode, which is called Formula One Meets Le Mans. Uh, we're talking about this topic, which is a little bit uh, outside our normal expertise, because we see that more and more Formula One drivers have a second uh, goal, uh, winning Le Mans, especially as uh, we will see this later, uh, this could be a part of the motorsports uh, triple crown, which so far was only one by one driver, which we will discuss. And uh, maybe this is a little bit a new tendency because we saw that at last in the 1980s, it was not uh, nicely seen by Formula One um, team uh, managers that their drivers look for other opportunities outside uh, Formula One because there is a high risk uh, of injury and uh, even uh, deaths. We had the... Uh, unfamous uh, examples of the mid uh, 80s that most German drivers in the same year, uh, Stefan Bellow and uh, Manfred uh, Winkelhock uh, died in uh, endurance uh, racing. Uh, we have uh, cases where Formula One drivers want to try out uh, the rally sport and uh, unfortunately uh, had an accident which ended uh, their career. But as the sports seems to get uh, safer, this uh, uh, turns a little bit. So we see uh, that uh, Formula One drivers are willing and interested to start it at Le Mans. And this time this uh, supported by their teams uh, because uh, maybe since the beginning, teams like, uh, let's say, McLaren, uh, they started in a garage focusing on uh, Formula One, but with the time, the company is growing and uh, has to diverse uh, their portfolio. And so uh, today's uh, uh, teams are professionally managed companies and they look uh, where besides Formula One, I can uh, start and endurance sport is a solution as for example, also for uh, Alpine and of course uh, for the Ferrari team. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, we uh, decided to do this episode because we kind of uh, promised uh, that we will do it at one point. Um, I, I believe it was when we discussed Jackie X, uh, I think it was yep. probably that that episode but um yeah there are kind of a few remarks i want to make um, uh, the, the first one being that uh, patrick probably many people will disagree with us on the fact that there was only one driver who won a triple crown because triple crown is defined differently but what yeah. we mean is there is only one person that no matter how you define yes. <laughs> on that. I mean, there are different definitions and according to other definitions, yeah, there were other people who, who have yeah. one. Uh, so we will discuss them as well. But yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, yeah, the kind of the overall kind of big, uh, you know, uh, big achievement is probably just one person that we want to highlight. Um, and yeah, in terms of, um, you know, um, Le Mans, yeah, obviously it's very, um, a very, very famous endurance race. And uh, we had a number of cases when uh, um, people didn't make it in Formula One, but uh, made a significant impact in Limon. And I think that's kind of the, was the main motivation for us to highlight this, this uh, uh, achievements uh, of these drivers who, you know, sometimes had remarkable career in Formula One, but uh, didn't never won the championship, <laughs> but, yeah. but they did succeed in Le Mans. Yep. And we will have later um, uh, one statistic, uh, uh, maybe explaining why successful Formula One drivers not automatically are a good uh, uh, successful endurance car uh, racer because it's like a comparison between 100 meter sprints against a uh, marathon where normally a good sprinter never wins the marathon uh, nor, uh, nor the other way around 
Yeah, and I just also want to say that if you don't know anything at all about Limon, probably the best place to start would be to watch Ford versus Ferrari a film uh, that will give yes. you a little bit of, I mean, again, this is all, you have to understand that this is all super um, sort of dramatized. Uh, it probably yeah. wasn't that dramatic in uh, in real life, but it gives you some idea of what, what it was like uh, back in the day to race and yes. a little bit about, you know, what it, what it takes, because it is a very, very long race. <laughs> Exactly, and it's a Hollywood uh, movie. It's a great uh, racing <laughs> movie. I think in most of the parts it's correct, but there are some details uh, which are not. But I mean, again, it's a Hollywood movie. It's here to enjoy, and I think it's one of the better racing movies. Well, certainly, huh? especially considering that it's a recently made film. You know, yes. So very, very. Uh, um, I mean, so some of the things that you can see that are very, very accurate in terms of, you know, what it entails, like, and, and yeah. how much preparation you need. And yeah, um, but of course, other things are kind of completely uh, exagger <laughs> exaggerated. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's uh, again, like, if you don't have any uh, sort of any starting point, that's probably the way to start thinking about Le Mans. That's uh, right. And so uh, Le Mans is um, significantly older than Formula One, which started in 1950. Uh, and Le Mans, we had the first race back in 1923. And since then, it became a yearly uh, tradition. There are some years uh, without uh, races. This uh, based on, uh, for example, 1936, the Great Depression and also between 1940 and 1948 due to World War II, we also did not uh, have a race. But besides this, uh, it's an annual tradition, mostly in May, sometimes a little bit uh, uh, rescheduled as, uh, for example, recently related uh, COVID-19. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I mean, we uh, sort of um, we we saw from time to time kind of the decline in uh, in interest uh, to Le Mans, but it sort mm -hmm. of kind yes. of remains one of those things that always uh, uh, is always there because uh, because it's quite a unique uh, set setup. I mean, it's it is a twenty four hour race, so very um challenging circumstances usually it's uh, very often uh, it very often rains <laughs> so which makes it very interesting because like uh, patrick and i explained multiple times in the rain everyone slows down and you kind of can uh, catch up in a superior car if you're a better driver in an inferior car so yeah it kind of makes it all very very interesting Yep, and uh, here you see, at least if you follow us on Spotify or in uh, YouTube, you see here a map. And uh, in opposite to Formula One, uh, it's uh, quite a long track, and uh, it's really uh, a track where you have to go on your personal limits because you see here the long, long uh, straight where you really drive uh, on your maximum speed, which is... Uh, not as uh, easy as you might imagine. If uh, you have uh, one of the various uh, uh, race games on your favorite uh, console, if uh, you drive there, uh, you, you see what I mean. It's really difficult uh, to focus all the time, especially 24 hours with light, with darkness, rain, etc., etc. Um, interesting, by the way, uh, I just see it. Uh, some of the curves are named after uh, famous participants, uh, of course, like Porsche, Ford, and even a Corvette. But even if, uh, let's say, Ferrari won various years, there's no Ferrari curve for whatever reason. Right? So it is just as a fan fact. Because it's Le Mans, it's in France. <laughs> maybe, maybe because uh, exactly of this, because of the rivalry between France and Italy. In, in this case, they yes, they included a Ford chicane, a Porsche, uh, well, the curve, which would be strange. I mean, the rivalry between France and Germany is higher than with Italy, but 
I mean, yeah, but take not, it just but as not in car racing. In car racing, right. probably, maybe, probably, yeah. probably the Germany and France maybe agree a little bit more in, in yeah. car racing than in other things. Yeah, but uh, I mean, it's just a specul complete speculation. Yeah, but uh, right. yeah, but I mean, obviously, you can see. I think it's fair to say that, uh, considering that we see Corvette and Porsche, there it's kind of more of a like certain tendencies to the, towards more like. Yeah for the francophone things uh but you know yeah uh, uh it it would be actually interesting to figure out why these uh these things are there so if you know uh, please let us know in the comments we'd like to know yeah that. You're, yeah you're right i mean uh, i mean also if corvette is a u.s car uh, chevrolet mm -hmm. was founded by a uh, french, french. Uh, immigrants that's right Okay, so uh, 2024, we are still uh, in the first half of the year, so before uh, this year, this year's uh, race. So uh, as we already mentioned in the beginning, it's not only that the drivers are looking to get uh, seats, uh, uh, to get uh, the, the fame winning uh, Le Mans, but also uh, teams. We see uh, the Ferrari, which won uh, last year. We see the Alpine a 424 for, uh, sorry a 424 and also uh, we have uh, the Aston Martin uh, Vantage uh, which wants to participate this year again so it's not just the drivers also the team understand the more is becoming again a more uh, interesting place as you've mentioned over the time it had declined in importance um, but I think it's uh, coming back again yeah, and I mean, uh, also, uh, obviously, during the pandemic, it was difficult to keep the interest uh, going because we had mm -hmm. kind of the substitute for Formula One in Formula E, but uh, here mm -hmm. we, like, you know, it's, it's difficult to simulate 24-hour race, race digitally. <laughs> I think it would be very um, interesting audience that would follow that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I think it's mostly for that reason, but also I think it's, uh, um, you know, it, you need to have a very special mindset to be able to drive that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very hard to train for it because obviously you can never train for 24 hours straight <laughs> on yeah. the track. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it has a lot of, um, like this, you know, like element of surprise. And I think uh, with Formula One becoming kind of more and more predictable, this becomes kind of more sort of exciting, like thrilling thing that you can um maybe follow and expect something unexpected you know to happen yeah. so yeah i think it's just uh, also that that the fans are kind of they want to be surprised sometimes and it's hard to be surprised now in formula one yeah you're right and maybe also the type of fans are um, different now i mean uh, a lot uh formula one won a new a lot of new fans for example via the netflix series so people following formula one because it's on fashion and the more maybe a little bit uh old uh, school even if the cars are completely modern so i remember uh, for example uh, last year you could watch 24 hours live streams out of the cars uh, so you could really sit inside the your favorite car and uh, see uh, how it's doing 24 hours uh, if you uh, wanted to. So here you see a big list of uh, Formula Formula One drivers who seem uh, already confirmed for this year's. Just starting uh, with the name dropping, we have former Williams uh, driver Jack Aitken, Sebastian Bourdais, Toro Rosso, uh, Sebastian Boemi, also former to Toro Rosso. Uh, Formula One champion uh, Jensen uh, Button, uh, the highly talented Nick de Vries, which for whatever reason didn't make it in Formula One. Antonio Givinazzi, it's, it's time, um, big hope uh, of the Italian uh, fans, but then also unfortunately lost uh, his uh, place and didn't got a new one. Uh, Romain Grosjean, uh, Kamui Kobayashi, Robert uh, Kubica, Daniel Quaid, uh, Andre Lotterer, uh, Mick Schumacher, again, uh, 
becoming active racer after the last uh, months. Uh, he only had been test driver. So uh, even if he may not find uh, a way back to Formula One, at least uh, he has opportunity to race again. Uh, Will Stevens, uh, Stoffel, Van Dan, and Sean Eric Wang, all the former drivers which want to participate at this year's Le Mans. Yeah, hypercars. <laughs> hypercars. So this is the number one class. Uh, last year winner, Ferrari, uh, the for, let me see, practically nearly after 70 years after the last uh, overall uh, victory uh, reached by Antonio Giovannassi together with James Calado and Alessandro Pier Guidi. Uh, important, uh, he was driving for AF Corsa, which is the official uh, Ferrari-supported team. Uh, manager is Amato Ferrari. As we said in the, I think in our uh, last episode, uh, Ferrari is a quite common name in Italy. So Amato, yes, same name. Yes, it's a works uh, team, but he has no direct family relation to the Ferrari uh, family. Mm -hmm. Here you see uh, 2023 photo after the victory. And the last one was 1965 uh, with the famous 2500 Limo. And also with, uh, with two uh, Formula One drivers, Marston Gregory and the later posthume uh, champion Jochen Rindt. Something uh, which also often gets uh, discussed in uh, Formula One is the way that the Formula One cars had been uh, grown over the time. I mean, if you see, for example, actual Formula One cars in comparison to a Formula One car in the 1980s, 70s, or 1950s, you see they are much, much, much longer. And uh, quite interesting, even if the hypercar, as you see on the left, uh, looks uh, much bigger than a Formula One car. It's really the other way around. Uh, this hypercar, this Ferrari has a length of uh, five uh, meters, while the Red Bull has a length of five meters, 63. So it's much longer than a hypercar. Which... Yeah, but, but it weighs less. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but it's uh, less, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I remember still in the 90s, uh, 80s, it was, of course, the other way around. The uh, hypercars, or as you would call them today, had been much bigger than the Formula One cars at uh, the time. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think this is also the uh, topic for considerable discussion in, in, in Formula One, because, you know, it's... Uh, um it's difficult to overtake for the reason yes. for the size reasons uh, and yeah so it, it has been definitely discussed uh, the size of formula yeah. one car yes and of course it's not uh, for mostly not for aesthetical reasons uh, but of course uh, safety reasons for the driver and also with the hybrid technology you need more space also you need more space for the sensors and these are all the reason why uh, it triggered uh, from that Formula One cars came uh, became uh, longer and longer over the years. Okay. Then in the next part of today's uh, episode, uh, we will briefly show you the drivers of some uh, we can speak about. Some uh, will be uh, beyond uh, name dropping as today they are became a little bit forgotten. So last year, I remember it was a big uh, topic, especially uh, in Italy, as, as I said, Antonio Giovannassi uh, was a big hope for Italian fans uh, to become, after a long, long time, again, a famous Italian uh, Formula One driver. Didn't uh, work out. That's why it was, of course, a big uh, celebration in the country that uh, not only Ferrari won after such a long time, but also uh, with an Italian um, driver. Uh, 
Yeah, I just want to say if you're watching us on, on YouTube and on Spotify, the statistics that you see like with wins, uh, it's, it means Formula One wins. Yes. But then uh, when we say Le Mans, so that's actually the Le Mans wins. So when you see zero, it's not yes. uh, like for this particular driver, um, Giovinazzi, uh, Daniel Giovinazzi, it's not that he didn't win uh, Le Mans, he did win Le Mans, but yes. he didn't win any uh, races in Formula One. So that's basically yeah. what it is. Right, story? and uh, also uh, uh, good that you remind me. Also important, we only uh, included here overall uh, victories, so we not included drivers uh, winning uh, the lower class, but we're just uh, speaking about the overall victory here. So you see, Antonio Giovinazzi had a promising uh, career. Starting in karting, as it's quite uh, the classic way, then uh, Formula 3, Asian uh, Le Mans series, and then uh, since 2017, uh, this, uh, the Sauber team. Uh, so practically, he had been a Ferrari person as Sauber, same as Alfa Romeo, Haas, uh, had been uh, using Ferrari engines. But unfortunately, uh, Ferrari uh, already didn't have the need for a new driver, and that's why what pushed him uh, outside uh, the championship. Fun fact, uh, he was uh, the first uh, Alfa Romeo driver uh, leading a Grand Prix since 1983. So this just as a small fun fact. Then uh, Swiss uh, driver Sebastian Olivier Biomi uh, also uh, as we discussed in the beginning, uh, in the past, uh, if you don't make it, uh, made it in uh, Formula One, uh, first option was uh, going to endurance uh, racing. Uh, today, uh, and this already since uh, some years, is changing a little bit as we see if you don't make it um, in Formula One, you may not go to endurance race. You may not uh, switch anymore to the US Indica series, but you may go uh, to the uh, Formula E championship. And this was, uh, for example, a strategy with Sebastian Olivier Bimi was uh, also doing. And uh, since the uh, end of the 2010s, uh, he had been in uh, good contact with Toyota. Toyota, uh, a team uh, which also, unfortunately, didn't make it in Formula One. And this, I think, will be the reasons why we will discuss, I'm sure, in a special episode in some years. Uh, but, uh, of course, a force in endurance racing. Yeah, that's right. And uh, sort of Sebastian is the, the bright example of when you did not succeed in Formula One, but uh, you did succeed uh, massively in Le Mans because it's, uh, you know, he has four wins of Le Mans. Uh, yeah. And for that reason, I think now he's uh, um, kind of making a, a, well, we'll say like a, a modest comeback, but nevertheless, as a reserve driver, a comeback to Formula One. So, yeah, I think it's yeah. uh, it kind of worked out for him, that strategy of, um, right. yeah, going to Le Mans. Yep. And uh, Le Mans and endurance racing, uh, as said, uh, uh, Toyota is a big force here, but in general, um, Japan has a quite uh, interest in endurance racing. So they also had been, I remember, other teams like, for example, uh, Mazda. And that's why we see uh, in opposite to Formula One, also here uh, Japanese uh, drivers uh, being uh, really uh, successful. Like, for example, Kamuai Kabayashi, 20, winning 2021 20, uh, with the uh, Toyota GR10. Similar, uh, next uh, Japanese driver, Kasuki Nakajima. He had been uh, a Toyota driver in Formula One. And of course, uh, Toyota as a Japanese team wanted to bring in more Japanese uh, talent, also to get more attention on the home market. Didn't work out uh, as expected, uh, as they expected. 
But nevertheless, since then, quite a force in endurance, sweet time, victories at Le Mans 2020, 2019, and 2018. Yeah, and um, I think that one of the reasons why Toyota didn't make it in Formula One is because of the speed of decision making, you know, so you always kind of needed to consult uh, Tokyo, like whenever you're making the decisions. And uh, some, obviously, a lot of the Formula One teams are able to make decisions on the spot. So and uh, I think the reason for them to succeed uh, in Le Mans is precisely because you have the whole year to prepare, you know what to expect. Yes. And so it's a lot less dynamic in that sense. So you basically have one goal and it's like an annual sort of event. So it's quite easy to, uh, to time that. Yeah, yes, uh, there, there you are right. Uh, but uh, also to be fair, there had been other uh, reasons uh, why Toyota had not been successful. For example, I remember it. Uh, most of the team had been the former rally, came from the rally department. They had been located in uh, Cologne, Germany, so very far away from regions where you have experience with uh, Formula One. Uh, so there had been various reasons and of course, uh, we, we uh, know Honda very successful also in Formula One. So as always, there are various reasons uh, which leads to success, but also which leads to the absence of success. And uh, I'm sure we will discuss this then also a little bit more on uh, detail. Yeah, and then we have a, a quite unknown uh, young uh, Spanish driver called Fernando Alonso. Uh, we will speak later uh, about our classic definition uh, of the double, uh, of the sorry, of the triple crown. But independent uh, if, how you define it, uh, he uh, has the uh, double crown because he won championships uh, in Formula One, and also he won the Monaco race uh, twice. So the Independent how you want to define it as he has uh, two crowns because he won uh, with 2019 Toyota and 2018 also with Toyota. And I remember uh, uh, Fernando Alonso, uh, he was one of the um, drivers who really actively had been pushing uh, because he wanted uh, to become the uh, triple champion, maybe also because at that time he didn't have a good ride in uh, Formula One. So uh, he started at Indianapolis with, uh, well, not enough success because getting the crown you were, would have to win Indianapolis, which he not uh, managed, uh, let's say, yet, uh, because in Indianapolis, uh, there are also, let's say, uh, older drivers, successful. So, uh, and he is still very successful 2024 in Formula One. So there's practically no reason if he twice again in Indianapolis, if he, I mean, if he is in the right car, he has the luck, uh, he could uh, still win this event too. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. Yeah. The next one, Ellen uh, McNish, uh, and uh, uh, he tried uh, also uh, Toyota. At uh, its time, but uh, with Le Mans, he had been uh, part of the Audi uh, team as they had their great run in endurance race and especially uh, Le Mans. So two times he won with Audi, 2013 and uh, 28. And of course, Audi, again, a name heard about uh, Formula One as they will officially enter next year. Next one, uh, active Formula One driver, Nick Hulkenberg. And uh, speaking about Audi, he will join the new Audi team uh, in 2025, uh, famously uh, known as the uh, Formula One driver with the longest time uh, without being on the podium, practically uh, besides the more than 191 uh, entries, uh, he still didn't have the luck being on the podium. And I think we can agree that uh, this is a lot of bad luck uh, because 
based on his talent, I should have reached this uh, by now. But again, if you're not at the right car at the right moment, then you don't win uh, races. And this can affect your career overall, because uh, if you don't win uh, races, uh, you not get invited by the real uh, front teams. Yeah, that's right. But we do have one Le Mans win. Him, so. Right, that's why he's <laughs> yeah, in, that's in why our episode. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, right, and uh, so he didn't want to win uh, with his new uh, employer Audi, but with uh, the Porsche Hybrid in 2015. Oh, famous name, uh, David Philip uh, Brabham, one of the few uh, drivers, which I'm just thinking we forgot to mention, including our Destiny episode. But um, in any way, I'm not very lucky in uh, in uh, Formula One. Uh, he started at uh, Simtech and uh, the Brabham team, but Brabham at that time was... Uh, really just the shadow of itself. So they hardly could qualify for the races. So a famous name didn't uh, help him uh, a lot, but uh, 29, he won a Le Mans with the Peugeot 908. Yeah. Marc Chenet, another Spanish driver, active for Minaldi, Williams, Again, Williams, not at a time where the team was on top, but the more 29 victory again uh, for the Peugeot team, yes. which had been at that time quite a force in endurance racing. I think he's still uh, today active at uh, Ferrari, commenting for the team, uh, giving his uh, insights, consulting, etc. Uh, oh, and... Uh, being, of course, their brand ambassador. Um, next one, Alexander uh, Wurz, uh, Austrian uh, driver. I remember he was discussed also being uh, a high uh, talent, work, uh, working for uh, top teams, uh, Benetton, McLaren, Williams, maybe not at the time where they've been uh, leading in uh, Formula One, but good names, but unfortunately didn't really uh, made it. Uh, if I uh, correct, uh, one uh, disadvantage is uh, also uh, his uh, height. He's yeah. quite uh, big gonna, for Formula One say, Yeah, he's very tall. <laughs> yes, he's very tall. So this, uh, uh, besides the, all the talent, as we always discussed, uh, you need uh, physical. Uh, uh, topics also may help or may not help, as in uh, the case of Alexander Wurz. Nevertheless, uh, two times uh, winner of Le Mans 2009 and quite a time before with the TW Air Porsche uh, back in 1996. And uh, Another um, Italian driver, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Piro. Piro. Yeah, I believe yeah. we kind of spoke briefly about him in uh, previous episodes, but yeah, uh, also very famous five-time Le Mans winner. And, exactly. Um, yeah, so um, definitely worth watching some of his uh, uh, performances in, uh, in Le Mans. So yeah, basically, yeah, kind of... Uh, um, very significant consistency uh, across uh, 2000s, like yeah, in 2000, 2001, 2, 6, and 7, uh, yeah. that he achieved the victories. And uh, yeah, for many years, he was like this textbook winner <laughs> of uh, yeah. Fremont. Um, yeah, very, um, again, very talented driver, but unfortunately not very well placed uh, in Formula One and uh, yeah, but I think he made up for it um, with his career in Le Mans. Exactly. And uh, I think he got the connection with Audi as after leaving uh, uh, Formula One, he was uh, quite successful in the various touring car championships as the Italian one. And if I remember it right, he became driver of the German touring car um, uh, team of Audi 
um, and which have been a quite a high tech uh, car uh, back in the 90s. And I think since then, he had a connection with Audi and as they re uh, yeah, re entered um, Le Mans, they kept him as a driver. And uh, as you see, this had been a win win uh, situation. Mm -hmm. JJ uh, Le Lechto, uh, Finnish driver, also uh, quite well known driving for the small Onyx team, then Scuderia Italia, Sauber, and uh, Benetton. Uh, also a replacement for uh, Michael Schumacher after uh, he broke his uh, leg, where he did a great uh, performance, supporting the team getting uh, the uh, championship. Nevertheless, also he despite the existing uh, talent, um, never made it completely at the top in Formula One, but uh, successful endurance racing, two times uh, winner of Le Mans, first uh, with McLaren and then uh, later with Audi. Yeah, and I just also want to encourage uh, everyone to see the footage from 1995. Uh, McLaren uh, performance uh, with uh, this driver, yes, so it's quite a, quite a remarkable and exciting uh, race and performance by him. Yeah, indeed. Um, Joachim uh, Winkelhock, uh, he was driving in uh, Formula One in the small French AGS team. Uh, he is the brother of uh, Manfred Winkelhock, uh, who uh, unfortunately died in endurance racing uh, the same year as also uh, Stefan Belov. So the post Formula One drivers from Germany died uh, the same year. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, he entered Formula One and also went to endurance racing. Quite successful, winning 1999 with the BMW V12 uh, Le Mans car. Pierluigi Martini, we just uh, discussed him in the last uh, episode about uh, family dynasties in Formula One, uh, not having a father, but an uncle driving in non-official Formula One races. Also, as many Italian drivers at that time, for the various reasons, uh, had been at the local uh, small teams like Minardi, Scuderia Italia, Scuderia Italia, sorry, and uh, but never made it uh, the next uh, step. But uh, also he, for him, uh, endurance racing was a good uh, second option. And uh, together with JJ Lechto, uh, he won 99 with uh, BMW. And then we have uh, French yeah, driver, Yannick Damas. Yeah, Yannick Damas, I think uh, many people would remember, especially if you were around in the 90s, <laughs> from kind of uh, the whole, uh, I think the whole decade, uh, quite a very, very competitive driver and quite dominating with four wins uh, uh, between 92 and 1999. Um, you know, and also driven for different um, for different teams uh, on, in this yeah. year. So, very sought after driver, and uh, you know, very remarkable results in Le Mans. It, I think the next one, everybody who loves Formula One uh, remembers Michele Alboreto, a very successful five victories. Didn't made it to win the championship as again missed the last part uh, of uh, luck. Stayed very long in uh, Formula One uh, for driving for various teams. Uh, of course, most famous for Ferrari, but also for Tyrrell, LaRousse, Eros, Footwork, Scuderia, Italia, and I think he ended his career at Minardi before uh, he. Um, switched to endurance uh, racing uh, successful with 90 in 1997 with the TVR Porsche and um, unfortunately uh, later uh, joined Audi where he had the fatal accident in testing yeah which we discussed previously yep 
Yeah. And yeah. next uh, from our Ferrari driver, Stefan uh, Johansson. S uh, same as Alboreto, also active uh, for various, various teams uh, besides Ferrari and McLaren, also for the smaller teams like Shadow Spirit, Tyrell, Ligier, Onyx, AGS, and uh, Footwork. So a total of 103 entries. Also, never um, made the last step, uh, no uh, victories, but uh, won uh, also in 97 this days uh, mentioned TV a Porsche. Yeah, that's right. Uh, interesting. Uh, after he finished uh, his uh, career, he became uh, uh, a painter. Well, I wouldn't say he, went, he became a painter, but uh, he did a lot of uh, paintings. Uh, so quite a, an artistic lifestyle now. I think you can see this on his website, if I'm correct. Then Mauro yeah. Baldi. Baldi. Mm -hmm. Yep. Active uh, for Eros, Alfa Romeo and Spirit. 41 entries in Formula One. Another uh, cases uh, uh, of drivers who didn't make uh, the next uh, step for various reasons. I don't think it was a lack of uh, talent, but again, being at the right time, at the right place. Uh, won Le Mans 90 in 97. And uh, Ghana, as you've mentioned, there are various uh, definitions of the Triple Crown, the total um, total um, triple crown, and you can have a uh, triple tr sorry a triple crown only related endurance racing, including the three famous uh, races for this kind of cars, which of course includes Le Mans, but also uh, two events here in the US, including uh, Daytona and uh, Sebring. So if you just uh, take uh, this uh, endurance racing tri triple crown. He has one. Yeah. Then yeah. we have uh, Derek Warwick. We talked about him when we talked about Tolman. Yeah. Uh, if you guys remember, uh, if not, then yeah, check out the special on Tolman. Uh, and yeah, so. Uh, Remarkable, remarkable career in Formula One. Lots of entries, but you know, no wins. But yeah, uh, succeeded with Peugeot uh, in yeah. 1992 in uh, Le Mans. Yep. Yeah. And the next uh, winner with Peugeot, which I remember in the 1990s, uh, really have uh, been the leading team in endurance uh, racing. Uh, former British uh, driver Mark uh, Blandell. Oh, no. mm -hmm. Yeah. Impressive yeah. Uh, list of teams also. Brabham, Ligier, Tyrrell, McLaren, 63 entries. Uh, very good uh, driver, but uh, not uh, made the last step. Uh, that's why also no victors inside Formula One. Then uh, Volker uh, Weitler uh, from Germany, quite short uh, career in Formula One, just for the very, very, very small real team. Uh, one uh, year, 10 entries. Of course, there are no victories, but uh, Le Mans. And uh, here with another Japanese team, the Master 7807B in the year 1991. Um, speaking about uh, uh, alternatives uh, to uh, Formula One, at, uh, I and I remember this also, uh, especially in the 1990s, uh, Japan was a quite interesting uh, place, uh, uh, especially for the drivers uh, thinking about driving in a back uh, team, like, for example, uh, Real. Uh, then uh, if you don't get any better options uh, going to the Japanese Formula 3000 champion uh, was a quite uh, tempting uh, offer or possibility.
Oh. Johnny Herbert, uh, here we're speaking uh, about somebody with uh, at least three victories in Formula One, active for Benetton, Tyrell, Lotus, Ligi, Sauber, Stuart and Jaguar, teammates of uh, Michael Schumacher, for example, a really talented uh, driver. And uh, today, maybe uh, even uh, more known as uh, announcer, commenter for Sky Sports uh, Formula One. And also he won with the Mazda. Yes. So Mazda really uh, pushed that year, not only having a good car, but also uh, Formula One experienced drivers. And then we come to Bertra uh, Gachot. Uh, quite, uh, and, and I'm sure we will uh, tell this uh, story uh, when we speak about the particular year. He had the bad luck to spend some time in prison, which opened a place at Jordan. And the story of Michael Schumacher in Formula One uh, began. So very talented uh, driver too. Uh, his career ended being in prison, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, he returned, but not uh, to better teams. And due to this, uh, also no victories, but again, a place in the winning uh, Mazda. Martin yeah, Martin Brando. Brando, again, uh, this is uh, uh, like, again, if everyone who is... Uh, a fan of Jaguar cars knows the name, uh, yeah. you know, not uh, not a very successful career in Formula One, but driven for a lot of teams, including large and small. Uh, yeah. But yeah, not not very uh, successful uh, career there. But yeah, in 1990, he won for Jaguar. And uh, yeah, so I think that's, that was quite a remarkable win as well. Exactly. And uh... Same here, maybe today more known uh, being a commentator at Formula One than uh, maybe uh, people still uh, actively remember his uh, career inside the sport. Yeah. Jochen Maas, one of the uh, examples uh, of a talented uh, driver, uh, always good, maybe never the fastest uh, uh, team colleague of uh, James Hunt, if you uh, saw uh, the movie Rush. And I think uh, also uh, better, uh, more successful in endurance racing, even if he won only once uh, Le Mans, but he was really a force in endurance racing. He was uh, at in the 90s the mentor of uh, Michael Schumacher, uh, Hans Harald Frensen, and uh, Karl Wendlinger as he was leading uh, this uh, team of this uh, young uh, drivers. So, uh, and due to this, I think more known uh, in endurance race really than from his uh, Formula One career. Even though if you are interested and I think it's really an, uh, an a quite fascinating episode because uh, we, we did for um, here for Data Driven uh, Formula One about him because it gives you, I think, a real good insight about a number two driver in a team. Normally we discuss uh, the big stars, uh, the number ones, uh, but here we did an episode about uh, a more of... Uh, about uh, the uh, second uh, best driver in a team, which I think uh, gave a good insight how it was uh, for these people. Then next one, uh, Jan Lammers from the Netherlands, also active in small teams, Formula One, Shadow, RTS, Insing, Theodore and March. And as he never made it in Formula One to the next level, he switched to endurance race. And also here, a victory for the Jaguar team. This time, we're speaking about 1988. Juan, uh, sorry, why spell it uh, Spanish? Uh, John Colum Christian Stewart, the seventh Marquis of Butte, styled Earl of Dumfries, or better known to the fans. Johnny Dumfries, very short uh, career in Lotus, 
maybe also with the bad luck uh, driving besides uh, Ayrton uh, Senna. Senna, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no opportunity to look good in such a uh, just, uh, just appearing uh, and un unfortunately also uh, he died uh, quite uh, young uh, to, uh, based uh, on an illness so no uh, accident but um, at least uh, he had the pleasure as the seventh Marquis uh, to drive a Jaguar uh, not only privately I'm sure he did uh, but also winning Le Mans in 1988. Hans uh, Stuck, uh, by the way, another name uh, we not uh, mentioned, we could have mentioned uh, him also in our Dynasty uh, episode, uh, only with the twist that uh, due to his age, his father was active in Formula Sports uh, before Formula One uh, was uh, born. Uh, he drove for March, Bradham Shadow, RTS, so again, the same um, small teams. He became very famous uh, in endurance racing uh, for the Porsche team. And yeah. I remember... I just, yeah, I just want to say that when you think uh, Porsche, you, you immediately think about him, yeah. Right. Uh, this is the really the famous uh, Porsche 962 who dominated, I think, the whole decade of the 1980s. Uh, then uh, uh, he not uh, retired, but uh, he joined the Audi team as they had been entering uh, the German Touring Car uh, Championship. Way. So he drove maybe two, three years uh, Audi before he then finally uh, retired. Yeah. Then uh, Derek Bell from uh, I think Northern Ireland, if I'm uh, correct. If not, uh, please comment. Uh, uh, quite uh, an interesting uh, number of teams. Ferrari, McLaren, Sotis, and the small uh, techno team. 16 entries. And again, uh, driving uh, mostly for Porsche. Winning Le Mans five times, and uh, sometimes the first victory is back in uh, 1975 with the Gulf Mirage GR18. Paolo, Paolo Bavia, yeah, we did, uh, discussed on uh, detail in our episode about life after Formula One. Uh, he had been the hire of the famous uh, Barilla company. Uh, but uh, it was not just the money, but also I think uh, he had been uh, a quite talented uh, driver. Uh, that's why he joined uh, Minaldi. Uh, and here, maybe it was not only talent, but also, of course, the uh, circumstances that he didn't have enough time to focus on Formula One. That's why uh, he retired uh, quite early from Formula One. But still, uh, 1985, uh, victory with the Porsche 956. So I think this is a good indicator that he not only made it because of the family budget to Formula One, but really he had uh, the talent as a racer. Right. Um, slowly we are entering the 1970s. Henri Jack, William Pescarolo, 64 entries. Matra, March, Williams, BRM, and Sotis. Not that successful as for many others we discussed. Uh, he reached uh, mid team uh, in uh, mid teams in Formula One, but never made it completely at the top. In opposite to uh, Le Mans, of course, uh, especially as a uh, French driver, a big uh, goal, uh, career goal. He re reached four victories, Porsche, Matra, and uh, two times more Matra, which had been very famous, as you can see, of course, in uh, endurance racing. Yeah, also famous in Dakar. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yep. that's another, another one that he was quite famous for. Yep, so somebody from Australia Winning well, 1983. Yeah, that's probably one of the few Australians 
in the yeah. competition. Um, obviously, Braham, uh, we mentioned already, that has those, those kind of root, right. roots from... Um, yeah, but, but um, yeah, so obviously, Australian uh, driver. And, uh, well, there are not many Australians in Formula One, as you can imagine, but um, yeah, very remarkable win in 1983 with Porsche in Le Mans. Yep. And I mean, the next one we don't have to present. We did a special episode. He's practically a senior Le Mans six time victory. And uh, mostly uh, he's, of course, aligned with the uh, Porsche team victories for Porsche in 82, 81, 77, uh, 76, and then uh, 75 for the Gulf Mirage and 69 with the Ford GT4. He did a quite impressive, he had a quite impressive um, career in Formula One, starting at Cooper, then of course uh, Ferrari, where he nearly became a champion, uh, but lost against uh, the posthum victory of uh, Jochen Rindt. So uh, he, as he declared later in interviews, his biggest victory was uh, surviving uh, Formula One. And besides this, active Brabham, McLaren, Williams, Lotus, Wolf, uh, Enzing, and Liger, eight victories, nearly winning uh, the championship. But nevertheless, uh, I think he's more aligned with endurance racing. Um, did you then we have yeah, the DPO only, yes. And again, the famous uh, win in 1977 in Le Mans with Renault. Yeah. Yeah. We discussed uh, Didi Pironi uh, a bit more in detail in our episode about uh, French uh, Ferrari um, drivers, as uh, uh, his career was, of course, also quite uh, tragically shortened, as uh, first he had broke his two legs in Formula One in 82. And after uh, this ended his career, and later he became active in powerboat racing where he then had his um, fatal accident. Uh, and for example, uh, his uh, girlfriend, uh, in the time of the accident, his girlfriend has been pregnant with twins, which she uh, she called then um, Didier and uh, Jill in uh, relation to Jill Veneuve, his uh, Ferrari colleague, which with whom he had a quite a difficult relation, at least in the last part of the 82 uh, season. But, uh, but before he became active for uh, Ferrari in the beginning of the 80s, uh, he was with uh, the French team of Liger, for example, and for Tyrell and Le Mans. He won in 77 with the Renault Alpine. Then we have uh, Gérard, Gilles, Marie, Amar, Larousse, another French driver. Uh, he participated two times in Formula One with the Scuderia Finotto, of course, uh, not of course, but uh, as you may not remember him, um, with very limited uh, success, quite an opposite uh, to uh, Le Mans, where he had two victories uh, and uh, with the all uh, French teams of Matra Simca in 74 and 73. Graham uh, Hill, and uh, finally also we come uh, to our definition of the triple crown of uh, motorsports. Here we have a person, I don't have to tell you this, very successful in Formula One, 14 uh, victories, uh, two championships, participating for Lotus, BRM, Brabham, and later had his uh, own uh, team, the Hill uh, team there, we first drove and later focused on uh, team manager because before they uh, his uh, life unfortunately was shortened by the fatal uh, airplane accident. Yeah, airplane crash. Yeah. yeah. So again, we have a, a special on uh, Graham Hill. So exactly, and. Uh, 
based on uh, the classic definition of the triple crown of motorsport, he is the only one uh, winning uh, this non-formal uh, title. So there, this is just a name. So there's uh, there's not, no crown, no golden crown, which you can put in your library or something. This is really just a um, non-official title, which you can call yourself if you uh, want to. Yeah. And uh, yeah. as you can see, uh, one time Indianapolis winner, one time Le Mans winner, uh, and uh, yeah, two time world champion and uh, five wins in Monaco which is quite difficult to achieve. <laughs> yeah. But I think it was like one of his favorite uh, uh, circuits in Monaco. Yeah, and uh, quite difficult. Uh, I mean, it's uh, quite nice to say it. I mean, uh, very difficult. I mean, this is the reason why there is uh, only one person who achieved it. And again, um, we, dis we discussed uh, Uh, that uh, others had been driving, pushing the luck, uh, and mostly what is, uh, for example, what is missing could be uh, like winning uh, Le Mans. Uh, and uh, important to mention that there's also a, a little bit uh, more a light uh, definition uh, about the Triple Crown, uh, where it's not the Monaco Grand Prix, but the uh, Formula One Championship in uh, general. Nevertheless, how you want to define it, uh, Graham Hill is the uh, only one having the triple crown, independent if it's the, uh, the championship or just focusing on the Monaco GP. Um, with this, let's continue with our uh, Formula One drivers, maybe we're getting a little bit shorter because there are many drivers where we don't have that much information as the more back you go back uh, in time, especially related motorsports, the more difficult getting information. Uh, Dutch driver uh, Jonkier Gisbert van Lennep, and sorry for everybody in the Netherlands for the pronunciation, Active uh, also for Williams and Singh and uh, SIN and winning uh, Le Mans 1971 with the Porsche 917K. Then next one, still active in uh, Formula One, uh, but uh, not as a driver, but as a consultant in uh, uh, Red Bull. Uh, And if you're following the 24 season, as you know, there are a lot of discussions uh, around uh, Dr. Helmut Marko and his relation to other leading uh, figures inside uh, the Red Bull uh, team. So uh, also his um, Formula One career had been shortened by an accident uh, where he lost uh, one of his eyes and uh, so he has now a glass eye and with this, he, it was not possible to continue his uh, uh, career in Formula One. Nevertheless, uh, also one victory at Le Mans for him, 1971 with the same Porsche 970K. Hans uh, Hermann, a uh, very famous uh, name in uh, Germany as he already, as he had been a quite uh, successful driver uh, before World War II. So already born, uh, we are speaking here about drivers, uh, now born uh, like in the 20s, active for Veritas, Mercedes, Maserati, Cooper, BRM, Porsche, 22 entries, no victories in Formula One, but one victory again with the Porsche 970K in 1970. Then uh, British title. driver, yep. Vicky Edward, active for BRM, Rec Panel Racing, Cooper Lotus, 70 entries, and uh, winning uh, the championship 1970, again, Porsche 970K. We have a short uh, break, uh, speaking about drivers. Um, 
but I think this is an interesting um, statistic. Uh, in the beginning, we discussed a little bit uh, that Formula One and uh, Le Mans is like comparing 100 meter sprint against uh, marathon. It wasn't always that uh, extreme because as Formula One started, the races uh, had been, uh, as you see here, in a comparison of just the Monaco uh, races, had been over uh, three hours. Uh, even 10 years later, it was still nearly uh, three hours. And also at that time, it was still possible for drivers to change uh, the car. For example, if you had a technical problem, uh, the team would uh, call in uh, maybe your fellow driver and if you are the number one in the team, like for example, it happened once to Juan Manuel Fancho, the, the, the second or third driver of the team would have to uh, provide uh, the car to you. So this is uh, as it was 1950s, 1960s. And since, since then, uh, uh, it, it changed practically since the 70s. The time is around uh, two hours, a little bit less for the Monaco race, so no big difference, only that the times uh, are the same, but it's like 10 kilometers more thanks to the higher speed of the uh, cars. And let's continue. Kiss, Jack, Oliver, another British driver, Active for the uh, famous British teams, Lotus, BRM, McLaren, Shadow, 52 entries, no victories, but uh, winning Le Mans with the famous Ford GT40 in 1969. And uh, speaking about Triple Crown, uh, he was the second driver to complete uh, the Triple Crown of endurance racing. The more Sebring Daytona. Then we come Pedro Rodriguez de la Vega, uh, one half of the famous Rodriguez brother, about which we did also a special episode, quite a tragic story as both brothers died uh, in motorsports. Motorsport. Pedro Rodriguez, yeah, Pedro Rodriguez in endurance racing in a Ferrari in a private Ferrari in Nuremberg, uh, sorry, in Nuremberg at the Avos. Um, and his driver, his younger brother, already uh, much earlier in uh, Formula One at uh, his home uh, Grand Prix in Mexico City. Pedro Rodriguez, uh, maybe uh, the, the, a little bit. Uh, slower of the two brothers but nevertheless he did a, he had a quite long career and he managed uh, quite good results uh, with with cars which not have been completely at the top at that moment so 55 entries and uh, two victories and also he won Le Mans with the famous Ford GT40 Lucien uh, Bianco, uh, Italian-born Belgian uh, driver, he won again Ford GT40 and uh, his uh, career in Formula 1. Uh, as many drivers at that time, it was still uh, a common place in Formula 1 that you don't have to, uh, to uh, drive the whole uh, championship as a team as today, but sometimes uh, you only uh, participated at your home Grand Prix or at another uh, race. Sometimes you get invited as a guest driver, maybe driving a third car. And this way, uh, Lucien Bianchi never had been uh, a driver who started uh, from the beginning to the end in the season, but sometimes had a drive here, sometimes a drive there. And he had been active for EMB, UTTA, uh, Rec Panelli, the Scuderia Centro Sud, and also uh, driving a private uh, Cooper. Nevertheless, two victories for him. So, um, man, in Formula One. In, the in Formula one. one. Yeah. Yep. Two victories, Formula One, one in Le Mans. So, again, somebody with uh, talent. 
Same as we can say for Dan Gurney, four victories in Formula One, active for Ferrari, BRM, Porsche, Lotus, Brabham, Eagle, and McLaren. And 67 victory with the famous GT40 from uh, Ford. And uh, interesting uh, side uh, fact, uh, Gurney is the first of three drivers to have won races in sports car, Formula One and uh, NASCAR and also uh, IndyCar a series, something which uh, only uh, happened later with Mario Andretti, who practically drove everything which has uh, four wheels and also by uh, Juan Pablo Montoya. Next, very famous uh, name, Bruce Leslie McLaren. Uh, another one about uh, whom we did uh, an episode uh, about uh, him alone as driver and also as uh, founder of his own uh, team. Active, of course, Cooper, Eagle, and uh, then at the end, McLaren. And also, uh, tragically, uh, he died uh, in a McLaren, not in Formula One, but uh, in the, uh, I think, in testing for the uh, Can M series, which is a kind of a US endurance uh, series at that time. Winner of double crown, meaning winning Le Mans with the Ford GT40, and also winner of the Monaco Grand Prix. Christopher Eamon, um, yep. another New Zealander. Yeah, and also the victory for Ford in 1966 in Le Mans. Uh, also dr driven for multiple teams in Formula One without much success, but entered over a hundred races in Formula One. Yes, uh, and I think uh, for him it's also valid he wasn't at the right team at the right time uh, because I think we can agree that based on his talent, if he would have uh, had a seat in the fastest car, he would have won a championship. Uh, Mustn uh, Gregory, uh, uh, a American driver, driver, American driver, of Kansas uh, City, Active in uh, Formula One for various teams, Cooper, BM, Maserati, Berra, Porsche, Lola, and uh, Lotus. Uh, besides this, uh, uh, apart from uh, Formula One, uh, he was uh, mostly aligned uh, with uh, Ferrari, not only uh, winning uh, for, with the Ferrari 250 uh, Le Mans, but also Uh, participating in all other kind of uh, endurance cars uh, races, including the famous Italian uh, street races. So he was really quite uh, uh, aligned for many years with Ferrari, even though in Formula One, he never drove for the Scuderia. And uh, Carl uh, Jochen Wendt, again, Another one where we did uh, already an episode about him uh, alone as uh, he is a winner of the double crown, meaning Le Mans, with the mentioned Ferrari and uh, Monaco. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, unfortunately, uh, mostly known as uh, the only driver who won the Formula One championship was Tom Min. He died in the season, but nevertheless, no other drivers uh, overpassed uh, his points. So, uh, two, six, uh, six victories in Formula One, won a championship, and unfortunately, uh, um, cut sh uh, short his life and career due to this accident. Um, with this uh, a less known uh, name, uh, Nico Vaccarello, another uh, Italian driver active uh, for uh, Ferrari, I think only, uh, but not as one of the two uh, fixed drivers. He participated uh, with uh, De Tommaso uh, 
which only participated one year in the in the championship, also with private Lotus and Porsche. So again, he was only active as a invited guest drivers, five entries in uh, total, and uh, but uh, one uh, victory. 1964 with the Ferrari 275P. So now we are in the 60s, where uh, at that time a Ferrari was dominic, domin, dominating at uh, Le Mans before they had been uh, stopped by Ford GT40, as you know from the famous movie. Ludovico Scarfiotti, uh, another one often invited uh, as a guest driver to Formula One, not only in Ferrari, but also Private Cooper and the Anglo-American Racers uh, team, 13 entries in total, and winning uh, 1963 with the Ferrari 250p. Uh, Lorenzo Bandini, another one which life had been uh, uh, short due to the fatal accident. Uh, another driver about whom uh, we did uh, a special, special uh, episode if you like uh, Grand Prix uh, for many Formula 1 fans this is still the best Formula 1 movie there is out there and if you not saw it I highly recommend uh, it uh, he was a consultant uh, for that uh, movie and uh, did also some kind uh, some parts of the uh, driving uh, for scenes for that uh, movie so really if you not saw grand prix yet uh, for many this is still the best formula 1 movie um, around um so he was really uh, a ferrari uh, driver outside formula 1 with all the various uh, events and inside formula 1 driving uh, Officially for the Scuderia, but also driving a private Ferrari uh, managed by the Scuderia Centro Sud. Olivier Schendelbein, a Belgian racing driver and sometimes called the greatest sports car racers of all time. Uh, very talented, uh, not only as practically as a driver, but also as commenter uh, and a journalist. Uh, uh, for example, uh, speaking about Le Mans, uh, he was the one who triggered the famous Enzo Ferrari uh, quote that uh, aerodynamics uh, is for people who can't build engine because uh, uh, related to the uh, Ferrari Testarossa at that time, uh, he complained with Enzo Ferrari that the uh, that the front windows are not as uh, are too stiff, and uh, due to this, uh, the cars lose uh, aerodynamics. Uh, he had a very, so he had a very good technical understanding, and even though uh, he won Le Mans uh, in 1962, where he mentioned it uh, to Enzo Ferrari, uh, uh, so uh, it's not uh, that uh, his conclusion was not wrong. Uh, quite the opposite because the two other uh, works, Ferraris, uh, didn't finish the, the race because they had been uh, using more uh, gas than calculated. And maybe this, because the car was not aerodynamic uh, as it should be. Uh, so quite ironically uh, that he won that year Le Mans. Phil Hill Jr. again, if you're interested, in uh, Mr. Hill, we did a special episode, first Formula One champion from the US, active for uh, a lot of teams, Maserati, Ferrari, Cooper, Porsche, ATS, Lotus, McLaren, and uh, Eagle, 52 entries, three victories only in Formula One. But again, it, that year, it was enough to win uh, the championship. And uh, two victories in Le Mans. Maybe three victories, I would say, or 62, 61, and uh, 58. So really, uh, as you can see also from his uh, yellow shirt, uh, really a US driver, but uh, mostly related to uh, Ferrari. Yeah, and, and unrelated to Graham Hill. Yes, that's correct. 
Um, Paul uh, Freya and uh, and I think uh, sorry I must say uh, the, the the story about the quote wasn't uh, gender bin it was Paul Freya so uh, forget what I said uh, the story is related to Paul Freya uh, the Belgian driver and uh, journalist uh, who, uh, who won 1960 with the Testa Rossa where he said that the car was not enough uh, uh, and not included the sufficiently aerodynamics. Um, so very uh, tech, uh, very uh, high technical understanding, active in Formula One, mostly, uh, no, I think only as an invited guest driver for HWM, the French uh, Gordini, Renault, and uh, also Ferrari. Roy Francesco uh, Salvadori, British uh, driver, uh, who uh, died at the Grand Prix in uh, Monaco. No, sorry, he not died. He died in Monaco, but not in a race. But uh, uh, peacefully, uh, many with ninety years, active uh, as mostly as uh, invited guest driver of Ferrari, Conor Maserati, BRM, Van Wal, Cooper, Aston Martin, Lola, uh, a lot of uh, well-sounding names. If you are interested in this episode, remember we started uh, data-driven Formula One with the episode 1950s, then uh, continuing year by year, right at the moment we are at the end of the 80s. So if you're interested in the time where we had Van Waals, Cooper, Aston Martin, also Maserati, check out our episode about uh, 1950s, 1960s. And he won with Aston Martin, the Bureau in the year 1959. Oh, then Shelby. another one, Kel Shelby. Yeah. Active so in Formula American One. American driver. Driver and uh, team manager as he uh, practically constructed uh, his own car, the, the Cobra based uh, with a Ford uh, engine. Again, if you're interested in Cal Shelby, uh, you have to watch, of course, uh, the Ford versus Ferrari movie, uh, even though his only victory had been with uh, Aston Martin in 1959. Very interesting uh, biography. Uh, first, also, he was a Ferrari driver in endurance racing, street races. But then, uh, due to personal uh, um, difficulties with Enzo Ferrari, uh, left the side, and that's why he also became uh, responsible for the GT40 project uh, at Ford. William Ronald uh, Flockhart, another British uh, race uh, driver, two victories, uh, both time with uh, Jaguar D types. Jaguar D-Types, maybe one of the most beautiful cars ever built, at least if we can uh, believe Enzo Ferrari, who once said this. I'm sorry, it's, this was related to the F-Type, not the D-Type. But anyway, D-Type, very successful, two times winner. Then uh, Ivor. Leon Juan Webb, uh, British driver, and as it was obvious in the 50s, Jaguar was the team uh, to beat, and he also two victories with the Jaguar D-Type. Michael Horton, yeah. yeah. who Horton, we yeah. discussed again at length uh, in a special episode, and uh, yeah, uh, obviously a champion. Um, yes. In uh, Formula One and uh, two time Le Mans champion. With correct, uh, correct with uh, Jaguar, but uh, Formula One a champion with uh, Ferrari in 1958 uh, after he retired uh, yeah, for uh, various reasons. I think mostly because he had a uh, very um, big uh, relevant health issues. And also um, because he was uh, quite emotionally affected by the fatal accident um, of his uh, friend and fellow Ferrari driver, and then tragically died on a street uh, accident already the next year in 1959. Also, uh, 
Again, fa famous Ferrari driver, but his uh, Le Mans victories had been uh, with uh, Jaguar. Then uh, Argentinian Jose Froilan Gonzalez, uh, famous for the first Ferrari driver uh, winning a Formula One race in the team's uh, second year, 1951 active for Maserati, Talbot, Lago, Ferrari, and uh, Venwall. Two victories in uh, 26 races. Uh, here you also have to consider that he started his career already before the debut of uh, Formula One. And 1954 uh, 54, uh, victory of Le Mans with the Ferrari 375 uh, plus. Maurice uh, Trintijan. French driver, victory 54 with the same Ferrari 375. Quite active, 86 entries in Formula One, uh, two victories, and you see a big, big uh, list uh, of teams where he was active for in Formula One. G uh, Gordini, the Renault team, Ecurie, Rossier, Ferrari, One Wall, uh, Rob Walker Racing Team, Scuderia, Centro Sud. Bugatti, Bugatti, I think they had exactly a participation of one race in Formula One history, and this was done by Bugatti. So if we ever do a, an episode about Bugatti Formula One, this would be the shortest episode we ever do, I think. So maybe for fun, we can do this. <laughs> Uh, but also active uh, Aston Martin and uh, important Aston Martin, big name, uh, especially today. Uh, but to be honest, in the 1950s, it wasn't a successful team, at least not in um, Formula One. BRM, Scuderia, Serenissima, uh, Rick Purnell Racing. So really a big, big list of teams where Maurice uh, Trinchinon was active for. James Duncan Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah, so that's the this is the interesting story because um, um, this is the only um, yeah this is this is basically the only time we had a drunk driver winning the uh, uh, Le Mans uh, twenty four hour endurance race. And basically, the story behind this is that. Um, James Hamilton and his uh, kind of co-pilot rolled. Um, so they uh, were practicing. So they were the drivers for Jaguar in 1953. And when they um, um, did the practice, it's a very famous story and a lot of um, you know a lot of speculation around it. So when they when they practiced. Uh, uh, for the race, uh, they used uh, Jaguar with exactly the same numbers uh, as the other Jaguar that was on, on, on track. For that reason, they were uh, disqualified. But then um, Jaguar contested the disqualification and they were sort of uh, invited back into race, uh, in the actual race. Uh, but um, being uh, British people, as you, or Irish people, uh, let's just say, in, in, in the case of uh, Hamilton. So what do you do when you are told that you cannot race? Of course, you go to the pub and you have a few drinks uh, because you are really upset about this. And so him and his, his um, <clears throat> teammate, they had a few drinks, obviously. And um, yeah, then they were told that, you know, you have to race. <laughs> Surprisingly, not only did they win, I think they beat several records uh, during this race. And uh, the team was trying to sober up um, uh, James Hamilton and uh, uh, by giving him coffee, but he said that he cannot really have coffee because it kind of makes him anxious and things like that. So they actually gave him brandy as a result. So he was even more drunk like throughout the race. And um, well, I have to say that um, the manager of the team at the time was England and uh, England denied on multiple occasions that they were drunk. I think for the just purely because it was then probably instant uh, 
disqualification and rethinking of the results would have been. But um, yeah, basically, according to the own admission of, of James Hamilton, I mean, he was definitely, uh, he definitely had a few drinks before he got into the car. And um, yeah, so this is kind of one of the funniest stories about Le Mans. Uh, was drink driving and you know having a speedy race uh, in 24 hour Le Mans. Yeah, and I think these are the, the stories uh, who make up also the muse of uh, of um, uh, Le Mans. I mean, there are um, uh, also other stories uh, of people of other drivers secretly driving at the team, uh, as it happens, uh, uh, for example, at. Um, the Ferrari a victory between uh, Greg Mastry and uh, Jochen Rindt, which uh, due to all investigations is untrue, but nevertheless, the rumors uh, stay and they are part of the magic um, oh, yeah, atmosphere this, uh, at Klima. Yeah, this time it wasn't a rumor, it was the actual, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, right. testimonial of the drivers, but obviously the management denied that and you know, yes. just said that they just exaggerated, um, over-dramatized, but yeah, I mean, uh, this is sort of the, the like yeah. one of the funniest stories in the history of, of Le Mans. Right, and uh, I mean, the only driver winning uh, uh, drunk, or at least uh, with some alcohol, coming from Ireland, it's not that we foster any stereotypes in this podcast. Okay, then uh, coming to Fritz uh, Ries, uh, another uh, German driver, uh, two uh, entries as a guest driver for the very uh, small, I think it was a German team, uh, Veritas. Uh, so no, uh, so really just as invited as a guest uh, driver, but nevertheless, with this, he already falls inside our uh, target group. And uh, this because he won uh, Le Mans 1952 with the Mercedes-Benz V 194. Peter Douglas Conyers Walker, British driver, active for ERA, Maserati, BRM, Conda, four entries. So you see again another, uh, another driver just being invited from time to time. But with this, uh, also he qualifies for our uh, target group, uh, victory 1951 with the Jaguar XK, XK 120C. And uh, let's see, two more to go. Peter Nealand to Whitehead, a British uh, racing uh, driver, born 1914, active uh, Sporically for Ferrari, Alta, and Cooper, and also winning mm. with uh, Mr. Jaguar XK 120C in the year 1951. Yeah, and quite a remarkable thing about uh, Peter Whitehead. Obviously, he survived uh, uh, the air crash in 1948, and 10 years later, he, um, yeah, he, he died. Um, yeah, so in. Yep. So it's quite a remarkable, again, quite a remarkable career. That's that's true. And with this becoming last driver, and this is nobody else than Louis Claude uh, Rossier, another French driver, of course, uh, being in France, uh, Le Mans especially attracts uh, French drivers, which are proud to participate in this uh, nationally very important uh, race. We discuss it. Uh, Le Mans internationally uh, lost uh, importance at one time. I think it's coming back, but of course, for French drivers, uh, this is still uh, one of the most important uh, racing events uh, ever. So always French drivers uh, highly motivated uh, to participate here. And uh, Clo uh, Louis Rossier in Formula 1, uh, at least the 38 entries. Uh, and here with uh, Talbot Lago and also uh, with uh, Ferrari and uh, Maserati. 
And T1 in the premier year of uh, Formula One driving uh, a Talbot Lago T26. And that's a, a big list of drivers. Honestly, uh, it's a longer list uh, than I would have thought about Formula One drivers winning uh, Le Mans. But as again, as a lot of times you get invited uh, uh, maybe at a home race to party to for, uh, get invited to drive, uh, let's say, a third or fourth car, uh, the list became uh, quite extended. Some names... Uh, very well known some people some names you may have seen the first time yeah with that uh, thanks a lot for watching if we missed uh, anyone let us know and yeah we're present in video format on youtube and spotify and on a lot of other platform in platforms uh, in the podcast uh, format so thank you so much and uh, we'll see you next time see you next time bye bye